Today on BRF TV Tank Trials, ULM edition, it's episode seven, and we're talking water, salt, and ATOs, and then giving away a Neptune ATK at the end. I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV Tank Trials ULM Edition. Tank Trials is all about taking everything the BRS team and reefing community knows about a very specific approach to reefing, implementing that knowledge, tracking the progress, and exploring the results. This is week seven of ULM and development of an ultra low maintenance system. The goal is a show caliber stable reef tank that requires as little maintenance as possible, potentially performing only a few minutes of maintenance a month. Today is all about water, salt, and ATOs. We're going to select options for our three tanks. We're of course going to attempt to find the lowest maintenance solutions. I'm going to start with salt since it's probably the quickest. Open and honest, if we do this right, we're not going to need a whole lot of salt because I simply don't plan on doing a tremendous amount of water changes. The goal in relation to a ULM is absolutely going to be to use water changes as a periodic tool for specific purposes rather than a component of weekly or general maintenance. So how can a salt be ULM? Well, it should mix easily. Ideally, it won't have levels so high that it rapidly precipitates after mixing. But really, I think the most important component is selecting a salt mix that actually has the same parameters as you have in your tank, so you don't have to play mad scientist testing or trying to add carbonate or calcium or magnesium and attempt to change the overall formulation of your salt to match your tank desires. Really, there's so many salts out there, there's just really no reason to pick one that doesn't already match your desired parameters for your tank. One bucket might be a bit cheaper than another or come with cooler marketing, but from a ULM perspective, I think it's wise to select one right out of the box that's formulated to match the parameters that you have for your tank. Most brands have a couple different options and one will be pretty close. For example, Instant Ocean Sea Salt doesn't list their parameters on the bucket, but I think it's generally perceived as primarily a fish only salt and doesn't bother with posting reefing related parameters on the bucket. Not surprisingly, many levels end up pretty far below typical reef tank parameters, calcium often in the 300s and magnesium often in the 1100s. However, the Instant Ocean Reef Crystals are much closer to most people's desired reef tank parameters at common salinities with 455 calcium and 1340 magnesium. However, the bucket doesn't mention alkalinity levels, so it's hard to say. Brightwell's Neomarine clearly states their target parameters and how they relate to natural seawater with 413 calcium, 1280 magnesium, and an alkalinity of 7.5 dKH. They also clearly state target goals for several other elements as well. Aquaforest Reef Salt has a DK to 7.7 to 8.3, calcium 440 to 460, and magnesium 1360 to 1420, which I think a lot of reefers would consider just slightly elevated. Red Sea has two formulations as well, the blue bucket with a DKH of between 7.5 and 8.5, calcium of 415 to 445, and magnesium 1240 to 1320, which is a window a lot of reefers maintain their tanks in. They also have their Coral Pro Black Bucket. This is based around an elevated level approach to reefing, which maintains fairly elevated levels aimed at faster growth. And when mixed to 35 parts per thousand, the DKH is 11.5 to 12.5, 450 to 480 calcium, and 1350 to 1430 magnesium. The DKH in particular is pretty high, but designed to be that way to meet the goals of their overall system. I will say that elevated levels in the Coral Pro does tend to produce some amount of precipitation in the storage container if it isn't used fairly soon after mixing. Our test put the HW Reefer at a calcium level of 445, alkalinity at 9, and magnesium at 1380, which is also a common range for many reefers. One thing I'd note in all these is these are target ranges for these salts. Getting a 100% homogeneous mix in every last bucket and then keeping it perfectly blended inside that bucket during transport is not really realistic nor should be expected. Beyond that, basically none of us have tools to perfectly mix and test samples, so I wouldn't get too upset if our hobby grade test kits suggest that any of these mixes are slightly off. In fact, I respect the clear ranges that Aquaforest and Red Sea provide. Some of us would probably rather see a very specific 8 DKH listed on the Red Sea blue bucket, but the 7.5 to 8.5 range is a more accurate and honest way to display it. So in the end, there's certainly an option here which you can buy and feel like you don't have to add anything to get the parameters correct for your tanks, and more moderate parameter level salts will likely have lower precipitation and mixing issues. Moving on to ULM water supply, I think a vast majority of reefers have an RODI system at home, and I can say producing water at home is certainly much less work than driving around town trying to buy it. Producing at home also makes it easier to know you're producing proper water for a reef tank. 
So I think the real question in relation to a ULM and water is in the RO filters and keeping filter change outs to a minimum. Changing out filters isn't something that most of us have to do that frequently, so it's not a ton of maintenance. And it's kind of boring, so I'm just going to share a few quick points which can keep filter change outs and general RO maintenance to a minimum. Sediment filters are not all created equal and some absolutely last much longer than others. And outside of that, better performance. They often also end up being lower cost as well because they last so much longer. The American made GE PureTrex depth filters are certainly much better than almost all the low cost imports out there, but the ROSAVE.Zs are the best example of a proper depth filter and literally one of the only filters where you can actually feel the density difference in your hand. Same thing with carbon blocks. Some have a giant hole in the center and some have solid carbon all the way through. Some are rated for 8,000 gallons with just 50% reduction and others like the BRS Universal 35,000 gallons at 90% reduction. So there's certainly opportunity to reduce the maintenance by selecting higher performance blocks. Dual carbon blocks installed in series not only scale the reduction to near 100%, but with blocks like the Universal, you don't even need to really be concerned about a bunch of factors with your water supply that most people don't even know about, like the disinfecting your city uses. Is it chlorine or chloramines? Because dual Universal blocks will work for both disinfectants. You can also auto flush your RO membranes for longevity and performance, as well as with the Aquatech kit rather than manual operation. And lastly, there's a slew of DI resin configurations. A single DI can is adequate for a vast majority of reefers, but a dual configuration adds a backup in in case you happen to forget or be away when it exhausts. There are also the Pro Series resins, and if you watch the BRS TV Investigates, you already have seen the advantages of running single bed resins with a single cartridge of cation resin, followed by a single cartridge of anion resin with the final polish provided by the mixed bed resin. This triple stage configuration not only reduces waste, it also reduces the cost related to high CO2, handles harder to remove contaminants like silica, and produces overall higher quality water but it also significantly reduces the frequency that you need to change the filters out and the maintenance related to that. It also almost certainly pays for itself. Again, most of us don't spend a lot of time on RO systems, but there certainly are ways to reduce the maintenance, which almost always comes with performance gains as well. Next up are ULM ATO solutions. This one's a big one to me because replacing evaporated water is a big component of a lot of reefers maintenance cycles. Either doing it by hand daily or frequently filling up some type of ATO container. Hauling around water is absolutely my least favorite chore with the tank and I'll personally go to some pretty extreme lengths to avoid it. I'm going to tackle a ULM ATO from two angles. ATO is connected to a reservoir and ATO is connected directly to your RODI system. Connected to a reservoir, I think the first element is it needs to be able to get you through an acceptable period of time between fills. In the case of our ULM approach, I'm looking to only have to do major tasks once a month, and that's probably not possible because the container would have to be pretty large. However, if we put lids on the tank, we could drastically reduce the evaporation and would easily be possible. That said, not many of us use glass lids these days because they get dirty so fast and to some degree prevent gas exchange, but a lot of reefers do use hoods which can have a similar effect. But without that, I think you could get away with a reservoir that holds enough water for two weeks. The container would still have to be decently sized. Most of us don't want to have a big, ugly container next to the tank, so I would suggest checking out an inexpensive furniture solution like some form of chest or footstool to hold the water container. If you have a home goods in your area, that's a pretty good place to find one. That said, if you're going to use that much water, you do need to explicitly trust your auto top off not to fail or it could flood your home or harm your tank. There are a lot of ATOs out there that will do the job, but I don't think anyone here has used anything other than the Tunes Oscillator for a really long time. It just has a proven track record and something I personally trust on all my tanks. If you want even more redundancy, you could install a float valve on the sump as well. However, related to that, Neptune just came out with a new ATO which uses two optical sensors, a float valve, internal timers, and while it works without an apex, it obviously does connect to your apex to provide automated alarms, even allow for leak detector sensors, and at face value, certainly appears to be a pretty solid advancement in ATO technology for our hobby, something that we haven't seen in a long time. Okay, so what if you want near zero maintenance with your ATO and never want to carry a single bucket of fresh water in your life? Well, both the Tunes Oscillator and the Neptune ATK can be configured to be connected directly to your RODI system, which completely eliminates a pretty major task for a lot of us. 
Now you are connecting a never-ending supply of water directly to the tank, likely in a living space of your home, so there are risks and any level of redundancy can fail. In this case, I like to use three levels. First is a solenoid option, which can be used both on the oscillator and ATK. This will open and close a valve when the tank needs water. However, a solenoid is an electrically powered valve, which with 100% certainty will fail at some point, so it should not be trusted on its own. I suggest adding in a backup with a float valve in the tank, just slightly higher than the intended water level. However, a float valve can fail too. It'd be fairly rare for both of them to fail at the same time, but I'm sure it happens. So I added a fail safe with a low cost flow lock leak detector, which uses a small absorbent pad to detect and soak up water to trigger a shutoff valve. Between all three, I absolutely feel confident that my tank and home is protected. However, if you have an apex, you can even consider running leak detectors to set off alarms and let you know if it detects water leaks in the sump or even shut off a secondary solenoid valve. I realize suggesting that level of redundancy inspires some amount of caution about the project, but that redundancy is just being smart. And frankly, there are other water elements in the home with much less protection, like toilets, water spouts on your fridge, or really any pipe connection in the whole home. If you're willing to put in the effort, I think there's a huge maintenance reduction payoff. A lot of reefers feel like this might be impossible because they can't run an RO line to the tank. But a lot of reefers will fish the line through the walls or ceiling. If you have a basement below the tank or attic above the tank, it can be done pretty easy. Some reefers will even run lines around the outside of the house, often inside PVC to protect the tube. Many reefers will even use simple cord management systems you can find at the hardware stores, install them on the baseboards, and run a line in that. So there are many solid ways to get an RO tube to the tank, even if the system isn't in the same room. So what do the community have to say? Starting with Z, you guys should add a bag of pods to one of those tanks. I'd be really interested in knowing if doing so would have noticeable effects down the road. Will it reduce the early algae outbreak? Will pod population be noticeably larger than other tanks at various time intervals? Will it reduce maintenance in any way? This is actually a really great comment and loosely related to today's topic. The team over at Algae Barn are sending us both some clean Kato as well as some pods to populate the tank. I will say that dirty Kato is one of the more common methods of adding undesirable pests to the tank, so getting it clean from a place like Algae Barn is a very wise step. Next up, Papa Smurf. As far as water goes, RODI goes without saying, and salt, in my opinion, would be lab grade, like HW Marine Mix, to keep all the contaminants, organics, metals, and whatever comes with uncontrolled water and salt out of the tank. I'll absolutely agree here that synthetic salts like HW represent much higher purity potentials than some of the common salts that come from natural evaporation ponds. David S., in the past I've used Instant Ocean with gratifying results, good coloration and health to all my SPS, LPS and soft corals. However, I had to make dosing adjustments to my alkalinity and calcium quite often, daily calc, then ESV2 part, followed by occasional use of additional elk and calcium supplements to balance things out. I think this is somewhat common results from using any salt that we all know full well has levels below our desired reef tank levels. David also shared for years I was using conditioned tap water for my replacement water. I always wondered why I would get hair algae and bryopsis blooms. I then found out about all the phosphate in my tap water. I changed to using distilled water from the drugstore and then realized it was just cheaper to buy an RODI unit. It took several months for the microalgae to melt away, but the tank has been free of nuisance algae scents. I think there's a pretty long list of reefers with similar experiences. It's pretty rare for long-term reefers to not just produce proper RODI water at their homes. Sean Dahl, I personally don't like tying my RODI into my top off in fear of it malfunctioning and creating a mess, but I have tied it into my water storage and mixing containers. This does require having to carry water to fill up the H2O reservoir, but I run kelk and I just add two gallons each time with two teaspoons of kelk. Yeah, I totally understand the fear here, and I certainly think you're in the majority, and I don't blame anyone for skipping it. But if you are willing to put in the effort, it can be safer than many of the other trusted water connections in the house, and it eliminates a lot of work. Okay, so what are we going to do on all three fronts, salt, water, and ATOs? Well, salt's an easy one for me. I almost always use Red Sea, Blue Bucket, or HW Marine Mix for my tanks, because amongst other reasons, they both maintain levels near where I want them to be in my actual display. In this case, we use Red Sea Blue Bucket for the BRSTV Investigate systems, and there's always a couple hundred gallons on hand, so robbing some water from there is certainly the lowest maintenance option for me. For the ATO, we're going to supply fresh water directly from the RODI system to the tank, so there's no need to carry a single bucket of top-off water around. 
To do that, we ran RO tubing through the ceiling and down the wall, and we installed a typical outlet cover with an RO bulkhead to give a clean looking point to attach to. However, rather than attach directly to each sump, we're going to do a bit of a hybrid approach, which is actually feed a small reservoir next to the tank and then feed the outer top off from this container. The reason we did it this way is because RO system's flow rates are so slow, it will likely frequently trigger the outer top off's internal time limit safety features. Keeping a five gallon container like this one full avoids that issue completely, and using a container like this has a few other advantages. One, we can have it empty near completely and then refill completely between cycles. This is a better solution for RODI system performance because we won't be turning on and off constantly, which can increase DI resin consumption. In this case, the tank will probably only turn on once every couple days. It's also nice to have a reservoir of fresh water at the tank for other purposes. For example, you could potentially feed a Kalkwasser reactor or other equipment from the fresh water storage tank. To implement this, we're going to use the TUNES RO water controller, which is designed specifically for this purpose, to fill an RO water container in the manner that we spoke of, which is fill the RO container until the switch indicates it's full. Then rather than keeping it full 100% of the time with continual top off, it allows the container to drain to a low point which triggers a refill to the top by opening the solenoid. Again, these longer run times make your RO system run much more efficiently and saves on DI resin. We of course installed a float valve in the container as a backup since the RO controller relies solely on float switches. The container that we're going to use is the Trigger 5 gallon Sapphire RO Reservoir because it will fit inside the sump area of the Softy tank. We'll route the tubes and pump wires from here to other tanks cleanly by using those cable management solutions that I mentioned found at basically any hardware store. As the ATOs themselves in the Softy and Polyp tank as well as the SPS tank, we're going with the Neptune ATK. It's pretty tough to not select that trusted Tunes oscillator, but even though the ATK will work on its own, I think there's a pretty reasonable chance that we're going to put an apex on these systems and the potential notification and connectivity advantages are pretty attractive. In this case, we have enough room to install the bracket which has both the high and low optical sensors as well as the float valve, really an all-in-one solution. We'll also likely install the optional leak detectors as a final backup solution. On the LPS tank, we're going with the Tunes Oscillator simply because there's very little room left over in the pump area of our sump with the two DC pumps in there. And the lower profile sensor puck of the Tunes Oscillator is just going to work better in this instance. I'm also going to drill a hole and install the float valve above that for the backup. In this case, I installed it fairly high so I can still get the pump out if needed. Lastly, for the water supply itself, there are a half dozen RO systems here running at the shop, but I'm going to install my own so I can feel confident that no one here will mess with it or shut it off without me knowing. I'm also going to run a seven stage unit here with the triple stage DI that I mentioned earlier for best performance and lowest change outs. The marketing team is working on producing one of these for sale and working on those final details like printed instructions and whatnot. So we don't have them for sale quite yet, but I would expect them soonish. As a workaround, I'm going to select a six stage Water Saver Plus system and upgrade it with a single add on canister upgrade kit, which I'll put before the dual stage DI. Just for cleanliness, I picked up a cheap triple U-shaped bracket and mounted them all together, which takes like two minutes tops. This is going to use those Pro Series DI resins. The install goes Purple Pro Cation, Blue Pro Anion, then Purple Pro Color Changing Mix Bed. If you do use TDS meters, it's not much value to measure between the cation and anion, but I would consider installing one after both, which should read at near zero, and then absolutely zero coming out of the mix bed. If you want more information on this, we have a variety of other videos on this approach that I would check out, starting with BRS TV Investigates Mix Bed or Single Bed Resin. That wraps up today, but next week is maybe the most important so far. What is a ULM approach to cycling a tank like these? When I say ULM, I don't mean just the easiest way right now, but what is going to set these tanks up for the best success and the least amount of maintenance in the short, medium, and long term? Don't forget, we're giving away one of those cool Neptune ATK auto top off systems, so click that link in the description below or head on over to the site, click specials of deals, and then free stuff to sign up. As always, if you like what we're doing here, let us know with a quick thumbs up and subscribe because we release new reefing videos all week long. See you next week with another episode of BRS TV Tank Trials ULM Edition.